Okay, so if you would move to the second one, um, the second slide. Thank you. So why is this, why is the state budget so important? You know, uh, I know he doesn't have anything to do with uh, our state, but in the early years, uh, the first year of uh, the Biden administration, President Biden said, you know, you want to know what the values of a government is, is look at their budget. And I think he got that right, um, because it really is the single most important policy statement um, that defines what's important to a governor, what's important to the legislature and the overall state. And it really um, demonstrates in black and white what our state's priorities are and frankly, how we're going to spend the money on programs and services um, to, to address our priorities. So it really, really is a very, very important. Next, next slide. Next slide, Helen. So how does this work? Just a couple of facts. First of all, it, the budget cycle doesn't begin on January 1st. And in fact, it begins on July 1st and goes, this is a fiscal year. So it goes from July 1st to June 30th. And um, it's really on some level, pretty much 11 of the 12 months, there's some budget work being done, One, not necessarily by us, but by um, the folks at the state. Usually July is off, but um, the rest of the time they're beginning to develop, to identify priorities, and to have conversations about what's important and what should be included in the bud budget. But one of the things that is required under our state constitution is, is that a balanced budget has to be signed by the governor by July 1st. If not, except for um, um, emergency services, everything shuts down. So let's go on to the next slide. And I bring this up, and I, I know Hannah's laughing, but I bring this up not because we wanted all to see uh, former Governor Christie in a bathing suit, but what we wanted to do was to say, so why, other than that there was a whole lot of memes and continue to be memes about the governor in this photo, why was it so important? This was taken on July 4th of one of the years that he was governor. And he had not signed the budget. There was not agreement between the legislature and him. And so he decided not to sign it. And so all of the state parks, including the state beaches, closed down. But the governor, who has a house on the beach, um, decided to go. And he and his family were on the beach, which was not allowed by any other family. So that's really got an incredible amount of criticism um, about that. And, and so while everybody out of the state kind of made fun of of the picture. It was really based on the problem and got him in a whole lot of trouble because he hadn't signed the budget yet. Okay. And by the way, it was signed like three days later. He couldn't take the heat. So no pun intended. Um, okay. So the, we're at our budget timeline. What is going on um, in that time? So August to September, the governor starts talking and planning. He's reviewing his priorities. He's looking at the economy. What shape is our economy in, at, you know, in the summer? And then he's doing some analysis of the, the programs that are already being funded through state dollars. In September and January, the governor begins to work with what's called the Office of Management and Budget. They're the, they're the numbers guys in our state. Um, you know, and they start talking about, well, what, what services do we need to continue? What can we cut? What do we need to expand? Do we need new services or new programs? And so they're beginning in that time between September and January. That's where we are right now on talking about, um, you know, what, what is needed. And, and for those of you, and I know Terry has done it in the past and has been part of it, actually, the Department of Human Services recently had their uh, budget listening session where they had an opportunity for people to come and talk about what within the Department of Human Services, what services were needed or needed to be expanded or should be cut. So that's going on right now. Now, once we get through the new year, Things um, begin to move a little more quickly. The departments are asked, okay, so what do you need? So the Department of Education, Human Services, Children and Families, Transportation, they're all putting in their budgets to say, this is what we need. Um, now, the governor in real life does say, look, you know, you need to give them quite a bit of um, guidance, shall we say, as to what should be included, but that's what's going on there. And then in January, in February, there's or late January, early February, the governor makes what's called a, a budget message to the legislature. And then from February to June, there's a whole lot going on. The governor's 
planning um, his portion of the budget that ends in February. So he's done by February. What happened? He doesn't get involved. Well, he doesn't get much involved until the end of it in June. It goes to the legislature and then it's, it's, it's um, their responsibility to begin to review it, to add, to subtract. Um, and they do that through um, what's called the budget and or appropriation committee. We have two houses in our legislature, the assembly and the Senate. Each of them has one of those committees. And so they open up several times. Um, and usually they do it during COVID. They were all virtual, which was fabulous, but now they do it in different parts of the state and they allow for people. It's the opportunity to hear from others who need, who want to talk about what programs that need money or what should be cut. Um, and then, uh, you know, and then they're also looking at, they have these public hearings, but they're also looking at revenues. You know, we were just on a call the other day with the governor's office and, and a few legislators and saying, well, you know, we're not sure how much money there's going to be. Um, so already that, that idea of whether or not there's money, revenue, additional revenues, that's going to reflect in whatever's put together for the budget. And then uh, towards the end of June, hopefully the the both the Senate and the Assembly have to vote on the budget. That is a crazy time because there's a lot of things going on. Uh, people are ad- asking for additional money, asking for add-ins to the um, to the budget. We've done that many times to ask for it. So that that hopefully will be uh, voted on by the Assembly and the Senate, and then it's sent back to the governor. Now, the governor has a um, couple of things he can do. He can what's called conditionally veto the bill, meaning if you make these changes, then I'm going to sign it, but I'm not going to sign it in this way. That's a conditional veto. He can veto it outright and say, no, I'm not doing any of it, or he can sign it. Um, he also has the ability to um, to what's called a line item. So he can take lines out if he doesn't agree that they should be part of it. So that's kind of uh, gives him the opportunity to reshape the budget in the way he wants it to look. But as we said, that has to be signed into law by July 1st. Okay, can we go on to the next? So we talked a little bit about, so I want to talk about formal budget advocacy. So certainly the most logical thing is for any of you and all of you, and I think some of you have done this in the past, is actually to testify. And that can look a different, a couple of different ways. Certainly, you can write testimony. And the example on the right is um, is an ACNJ testimony, talking about what we think should be included in the budget, meaning what should be funded in the budget. Um, and that's certainly one way of doing it. But it can be just written testimony. It can be written and going actually to testify. Again, I mentioned something about during COVID. Um, the the hearings were the budget hearings were primary were were all on zoom that's shifted back to being in person although the dhs listening session was actually still zoom i think it provides an opportunity for more people who let's face it you guys have jobs it's hard to take a half a day or a full day off to go to trenton or to go wherever the opportunity is that um the hearings are being held to testify. It's one thing, I, you know, I, many times on during during COVID, I would be able to work, you know, I was sitting at my desk or my dining room table um, and was doing work while waiting for my name to be called. And I didn't have to travel to Trenton. You know, most of the time since then, though, we've been traveling to Trenton or wherever they are. So, uh, so there's your formal testimony, written, uh, oral, or written and oral. Um, opportunities to testify. Uh, why is this important? Well, it's it's a way in which the state is hearing from others. You know, I think they have a very lopsided view. They don't always get a full picture of how their decisions, their funding decisions are actually impacting those who are either benefiting or who actually have to implement them. So hearing from you is, is, is wonderful. Um, um, okay, so let's go on. But I want to talk about informal budget advocacy. You know, I, I think we forget that the governor and the legislature, first of all, 
we have a legislature that goes 365 days a year. They're, they're quote unquote in session. A lot of states do not have that. They may have just a few weeks per year, but they're around or their staff is around all the time and not just during the budget process. And so when there are issues that beyond budget, um, that that are affecting your program, that are affecting you personally or your family, they are there. They are, are there to help you. You are their constituents. So it's it's important that you remember that that while the formal advocacy, like a time to go to a hearing and testify on the budget, is one thing, the role you can play and the relationship you can build with a little harder with the governor, but he has staff. And the legislature is very, very important. Okay, let's go on. So, so where I, because a lot of you are parents and, and even providers, I think whether no matter what role you play, we tend to underestimate our own power and influence. And I think that if, um, when they hear from many people, it really does make a difference. There's somebody in the office actually checking off who supports what, who is against what. So that's how they get a better feel of how they can best um, work within the, within government to make sure that your needs are being met. And I think what makes a difference then, Hannah and I, so, you know, we, we love our work. We're we're um, passionate about it. But at the end of the day, every two weeks, we get a paycheck to work on this. We're not on the ground. And the stories are linked to the advocacy that we try. So when I testify, for example, I'm talk- I'll am talking. i give an example just recently. I testified on a bill uh, last week that would provide categorical eligibility to all child care staff. So in other words, a child care worker, because we know they have low, low wages, we would like them to be able to benefit in another way. So why can't we in New Jersey, like the state of Kentucky is doing, is to make all child care staff eligible for a child care subsidy. So it would be, while it's not money in your pocket, it's one less worry for a family who may have children who need care um, during the day. So I testified on the big, you know, on the, on the, um, the policy end. And then an administrator, we worked this out, an administrator, an assistant director of a child care program came and testified. She was, had two children. Her um, youngest child was, I want to say like five or six months old, but the struggle that her and her husband went through because they couldn't afford childcare, even though they were both working, the husband couldn't take a um, um, couldn't take a, uh, a new job because they they couldn't work the hours out, and she had to actually cut back her hours. So it's it's a wonderful combination to be able to talk about a po- the policy end, but also so what does that look like? Um, and I thought that was a great example that just happened the other day. And it helps legislators understand issues better. And again, don't forget that you are their constituent. They don't hear from parents enough and you have so many stories to tell. Okay, let's go on. So informal, so you might say, okay, formal, you get it. You're going to the budget, you're going to a budget hearing, you're going to be before like the assembly budget, the Senate budget. But what about who do you advocate to for informally? And this, this, the answer is the same people. For a state budget, it's, you know, your elected officials, either the governor or the legislature. It's the same as your federal government too, our members of Congress. You know, there there are certain things that, that are uh, controlled by them. So that would be Senator Booker, Senator Menendez, and whoever your member of of the House of Representatives, your member of Congress is. So even informally, you don't have to wait till budget season to reach out to them. Yes, go ahead. So um, it's important in these calls, whenever they are, this informal budget, informal advocacy is to let them know. I want to give an example that happened during COVID where a um, where a father got in touch with me and said, look, I, my wife and I are working where every, everything is closed down. We are going, we did find a 
program, but their hours aren't enough. We're, we're not sure what to do. And we can really, we have no family nearby and we can't really afford to keep our child in longer. And it's really struggling. And we're trying to figure out who's leaving their job. We told that to a, a group of legislators and in a meeting, a national meeting, I was talking about this and that father got asked to go to speak at the White House um, with the Secretary of Health and Human Services because it was a real life story, a real life situation. And, and his story reflected the stories, the stories of so many other families. So that ability to explain this is what's happening to me is so different than the work Hannah and I do. So that's that it can make a difference. Let's go on here. So when do you do this? There's no right or wrong time. Um, I guess the most important thing is don't have that one and done mentality. So many times I hear from providers and well, I sent a letter. Well, you know, sometimes you have to call and send a letter. And I mean, that's kind of what advocates do all the time. I'm, I'm a, I always say I'm a professional nudge. You know, I have to nudge people to try to, okay, remember this. I, I'm re uh, reaching out. It's very, very important that you don't say, well, I sent a letter, but nothing happened. Well, that's okay. The more they hear from you, you begin to build a relationship with them. Next. So, you know, certainly the informal advocacy is the usual ways, writing a letter, giving them a call, asking to meet with them on Zoom. That would be great. And I think really I, COVID was awful, but it did open up ways, even if the formal budget hearings, for example, are back to being in person, there's no reason why if you call and you have an issue or you have a group of people with an issue that you, can you can't you can ask a state legislator or their aide, can we have a Zoom call about this? It certainly makes it easier to be, um, to be an advocate. Next. Okay, so getting back to what can parents do? And I always say, let your voice be heard. It shouldn't just be people like Hannah and me. It's talk to and organize other parents. Numbers matter when they say volume matters. I'm um, getting to say that again, Hannah. Uh, volume matters. When they hear from a lot of people, they take notice. And it's very easy to contact your policymakers. If you go to njledge.org, you can find your legislator. You look where the town that you live. Um, you can testify, you can write letters. You can also write to your uh, letters to your local newspapers about um, about an issue that's upset con you're concerned about. And I, again, and I say I'm a professional nudge. You have to become an advocacy nudge. Go ahead. And just just in closing, look, as I said, the one and done, be patient. Um, this change is hard on every level. You have to be persistent. You have to stay informed. So understand the issues. Keep other parents informed. Think about different ideas and just don't give up. I mean, I think that that's key. And ACNJ has always been there to help, to provide some context. That's key. But you don't underestimate, as I've said, the importance of who you are and the stories you need to tell in order to drive change. So maybe, honey, you want to turn it off or... Oh, one, okay. Let's just talk about this. I don't know if we're talking about um, childcare. I added this in because, you know, there, that we're kind of at a at a crossroads with childcare. The federal dollars, federal COVID dollars, have ended. The minimum wage is going to increase on in, on January fifteenth, which is a good thing. The problem is you have to have the money to be able to pay for it. Um, so it is it is at end. And do you have? programs that really don't feel that they have the ability to raise their tuitions, which is different than the child care subsidy, which is assistance to low-income working families. Because families, even if, when they're not eligible, it's really expensive to pay for child care. So it's kind of at this, you know, a critical time where what's going to happen to child care. So that's certainly something that um, that is important to talk about if you're having experiences Um because these are experience, these issues have have been around long before uh, COVID, and we're hoping that the legislators will begin to look at and say, okay, this is a public good; it needs to be funded adequately and treated that way. So there's still plenty of work to be done. So I think that's it now. <laughs>